Hi, I'm Bobby Valentine. You know, during my playing career, I saw dozens of pictures of me in newspapers and magazines. But the first time I saw myself on a baseball card, I knew I made it to the major leagues. Baseball cards are more than just photographs of baseball players. With statistics on the back and pictures of players and ballparks and uniforms on the front, baseball cards are a kind of special language that fans everywhere speak. And they're a great way to share in the excitement and the drama of Major League Baseball. By keeping and displaying baseball cards, a collector can capture the memories of an exciting season, a famous era, or perhaps just a time in life when things were simpler and baseball was something special you shared with Dad. Today's cards will capture the memories of his parents. Their collections will let them relive their memories of ballparks pennant races, and dads. When I was a boy, card collecting was a lot simpler than it is today. In 1958, there were only six or seven obscure regional sets produced in the entire United States, and the only major set issued was this set of 494 cards by Topps. But 30 years later, in 1988, over 200 sets of baseball cards were produced. These are just a small part of the cards issued in that year. It's unbelievable, but it would cost you well over $3,000 to buy every baseball card made in 1988. So card collecting these days is not only complicated, it's expensive. And if you're like most people, you need some help in deciding which cards you want to buy. That's what this video is all about. I'm going to cover the history of baseball card collecting since the early 1950s. I'll explain how cards used to be issued by series until 1974, and how that distribution method influences the prices of older cards today. I'm going to cover the cultural phenomenon that nostalgia has become, and how the growing popularity of card collecting created the need for dealers, card shops, and price guides. I'm going to explain how the value of a card is determined by how old or how scarce it is, what kind of condition it's in, or most of all, whose picture's on the card. By watching this video, you're going to learn the differences between major sets and update sets, regional sets and specialty sets, and I'm going to talk about the advantages of price guides, card shows, and hobby newspapers. Throughout the video, I'll summarize what we've covered. In the 1950s, when I was a kid, collecting baseball cards was nothing more than a harmless pastime for little boys. Cards only cost a penny, and nobody thought they were worth more than that. They were only worth whatever cards they could be traded for, and how much fun they were to collect. Today, <laughs> the hobby of collecting baseball cards is a multi-million dollar industry, and boys and girls and moms and dads have all gotten involved. Let's take a look at what happened to cause the hobby's phenomenal growth. The first baseball cards were made about a hundred years ago. But today's style of card, with an actual color photo of a baseball player on the front and his statistics on the back, didn't appear until the early 1950s. No baseball cards were issued during World War II. But, by 1951, both the Bowman Gum Company and the Topps Chewing Gum Company were packaging cards with flat pieces of pink bubble gum in the same way some cards are still sold today. Topps bought out Bowman after the 1955 season and with their 1957 set, changed the size of the baseball cards from 2 and 5 eighths to 3 and 3 fourths inches to the two and a half by three and a half size that is still the standard of baseball cards today. After 1956, Topps was the only company issuing a major set of cards each year, and card collecting remained a fairly simple process through the 1960s and 70s. Collecting baseball cards meant buying and opening enough gum packs at candy and grocery stores until a set was complete. Until the 1980s, there weren't a lot of other sets to collect. In 1980, the last year Topps was still the only company issuing a major set, a collector could walk into a store, buy three boxes of Topps cards just like this, 
after opening and sorting them, usually have a complete set. His card collecting for the year could be over in one weekend. Baseball card collecting will never be that simple again. The next year, 1981, Tops went from having no competition to competing with two companies in one year. This was the year that Donruss and Fleer first went head-to-head -head with Tops with full major sets, and by 1984, they were clearly established as part of the hobby. In 1988, a fourth major set, produced by SCORE, was immediately accepted by collectors. And it's obvious that other companies like Sports Flicks and Upper Deck will be attempting to gain the national acceptance these other sets have attained. If all these companies are making all these cards, somebody must be buying them. Why are so many people of all ages collecting baseball cards today? How did the hobby grow from a simple pastime to a major industry? In the early 1950s, both Bowman and Topps established that a set of baseball cards should include a card of as many of the players on the Major League rosters as possible. If a collector completed a set, then he had a card of almost every Major League Baseball player of that current season. Each card was numbered on the back, and they were released by numbered groups called series. The method was the same each spring. Several weeks after boxes containing gum packs of only the first series had reached store shelves across America, the boxes containing gum packs of only the second series would be released. Several weeks later, series number three would be released, until eventually all the cards in the set had been issued. An unfortunate result of this method of distribution was that by the middle of the summer, many stores and wholesalers in little towns all across America already had more cards than they could sell for the rest of the year, and yet hadn't ordered any boxes of the last two series of cards. Collectors throughout the country were unable to find any cards of the last series or two in their area. Also, because Tops had received less orders for these later series, far fewer of the cards in the last series or two were printed than the number of cards printed of the earlier series. In some years, the higher numbered cards of a set were never made available to entire regions of the country. Tops ended this frustration for the collector in 1974, when they began releasing all series at once. Instead of staggering the releases of each series throughout the spring and the summer, and each display box containing cards of only one particular series, any box or package of gum cards can contain any card of the entire set, whether it be card number one or card number 600. This was pretty irrelevant information for most of the people in America until the mid-1970s. By this time, the first card collectors of the modern era, those men who were young boys in the mid to late 1950s, were settling into being fathers themselves, probably not having paid much attention to baseball cards for 15 or 20 years. A wave of nostalgia that is still gaining force a decade later began to sweep across the country. Not only baseball cards, but dolls, comic books, James Dean, Elvis, the Beatles. America's culture of the 1950s and 60s was in big demand. As the desire for these items increased, so did their value. Nostalgia became an industry. Unused buildings became indoor flea markets for antiques and collectibles. Some people recognized these growing markets and established themselves as middlemen or dealers, buying memorabilia from one person and selling it to another. Here's the book. Baseball card collecting grew more than any other hobby during this period. And it was dealers the adult baby boomers turned to as they searched for the cards their mothers had thrown away 20 years earlier. That really looks good. That really looks good. How much did you say this one was? As these dealers learned which cards sold faster and which cards were harder to find, they began to establish price lists. The price list 
lists and checklists that dealers had been developing were not available to most of the hobby until March 1979, when the first annual Sport Americana Baseball Price Guide was published. The publication of this book was a milestone for the hobby. It gave every collector and dealer one common price for practically every card ever made. In 1984, with prices of the cards of major cigarettes changing almost daily, monthly price guides listing the values of these major sets and their star cards became necessary. This takes us back to those frustrating summers when collectors had so much trouble locating the last series or two of top sets. As dealers and collectors discovered that certain series were a lot rarer than others, price guides reflected this scarcity by raising the prices of the cards in the rarer series. In fact, scarcity became one of the four basic factors dealers used to determine the value of a card. They were the popularity of the player shown on the card, the available quantity of a card, what kind of condition the card is in, and how many years ago the card was issued. Cards of star players were labeled star cards, and those of the rest of the players were labeled common cards. In every set issued after World War II, the star cards are the most expensive. Generally, the older the card of a star, the more expensive it is. So a player's rookie card is usually his most valuable. As a perfect example of how star status and age of card typically affects the value of cards, this 1965 rookie card of Steve Carlton is his most valuable card, more than twice as expensive as his next issued card in 1967. And the 1967 card is worth with almost twice as much as his 1968 card. All of these cards, however, are worth 50 to 150 times that of this much more recent 1983 card. Those of you who are interested in only cards from the 1980s don't have to be too concerned about scarcity affecting the price of the cards. But collectors interested in cards and sets from before 1974 will discover that some cards are much more difficult to find than others. Here's an example of what scarcity can do to the value of a card. These 1955 cards of these two great players are three and four times as much as their 1956 cards because the 1955 cards are from the last and much scarcer series of the 1955 top set. When a star's rookie card is also in the rarest series of a set, the value tends to skyrocket. Even common players are affected. These 1966 Topps cards are of players whose cards are considered to be commons, but the cards of the last series are 15 times as expensive as those from the earlier series. Another feature of your cards that will make a big difference in what they're worth is the kind of condition that they're in. When most collectors quote the value of a card, they're talking about how much a dealer would charge for it if it was in mint condition. But if a card's damaged in any way, either by factory mistakes or from wear and tear from collectors, the value can decrease considerably. Let's talk about factory damage first. Sometimes cards are miscut at the factory, and when you take them out of the pack, look like this instead of this. Sometimes manufacturing processes leave cards discolored or out of focus. Or with printing lines right through the picture. Even the wrappers themselves can permanently damage cards. A stain like this is made when the melted wax of the wrapper makes contact with the back of the card. An important rookie card with a stain like this could easily lose half its value. 
A common cause of collector damage is the method of separating cards by teams and putting rubber bands around them. As you can see, the pressure on the sides of the cards left many of them noticeably damaged. Many collectors today put their cards into clear plastic pages, which allows them to be protected while still being enjoyed. Other collector damage that can ruin the value of a card is writing on a card. Allowing a card's corners to be rounded or bending increasing cards. Dealers and collectors have tried to establish categories describing the different degrees of damage to cards. A card that has absolutely nothing wrong with it is called mint. Excellent and very good cards have very little damage, while good and fair cards have real noticeable problems without being ruined. A poor card is a ruined card. Not very many people are going to agree on the exact category of condition a card belongs in. So, the best way to find out what condition your cards are in and how much they're worth is to ask the advice of a dealer. If you don't agree with his evaluation, then take your cards to other dealers until you feel comfortable with someone else's rating system. If you don't live near a dealer, then take your cards to a baseball card show where you can get the opinion of several dealers. Categories like excellent, good, and fair are useful words to add to your vocabulary, but don't expect other dealers and collectors to grade cards exactly the same way you do. We've talked about how star cards are worth more than common cards, and you've learned how a star's rookie card is his most valuable card. And I told you that his older cards are worth more than his newer ones and that the star cards in the rarer series are some of the most expensive cards in the hobby. You've learned that the better condition a card is in, the more money it will be worth. And we've covered some of the ways cards can be damaged, both by collectors and in the factory. Now it's time to decide which cards you want to collect. There are lots of companies besides Flair, Score, Tops, and Domrus issuing sets of baseball cards. Many are called regional sets, like sets of minor league teams, or a set of cards of just one major league team. Other sets are called specialty sets and might include cards of the best major league hitters or pitchers, or include cards of just rookies or all-stars. Well, maybe not. His corner's a little bent. Maybe, maybe very good, huh? If you're interested in collecting any of these sets, but want to be able to keep track of how much they're worth, you'll need to buy an annual price guide. You might already know that monthly price guides list the prices of only the major sets of Bowman, Topps, Fleer, Donruss, Score, and Sports Flick, and any update sets these companies issue. But annual price guides are published in book form once a year and include prices on nearly every set of cards ever issued. From the turn of the century cards to all the new regional and specialty sets. Complete set values are listed and then all the cards in the set are listed in chronological order with three degrees of values posted for each card. The prices in the mint or near mint column are much more useful than the prices for the cards in lesser condition. Once a card is damaged, dealers and collectors have a lot harder time agreeing on its value. Actually, price guides would probably be more helpful if they listed only the mint or near mint price for each card and left the values of the other conditions of cards up to the dealers and the collectors. They could then print a second column showing a trade-in value for each card which would represent a wholesale value that dealers were willing to pay collectors for their cards. These trade-in or wholesale values for mint cards could be used by collectors to calculate what their cards are worth since very few collections will ever be sold for mint near mint values price guides currently use.
Whether or not price guides decide to implement a trade-in value, they are extremely useful for several other reasons. They are the only source for prices and checklists of many rare old sets and also list checklists and prices for the latest regional and minor league sets. They are the only nationwide method of pricing any set other than those listed in monthly price guides. Annual price guides also include a history of baseball cards, more information about how condition is graded, and tips on card collecting in general. While annual price guides give you prices and complete checklists on nearly every set ever made, monthly price guides only list the stars of major sets and update sets. Monthly price guides reflect where the action is. The cards listed there are the ones collectors are most interested in, and so their prices need updating more often. If you're a collector wondering which cards will become more valuable in the years to come, these sets and the star cards that they include are currently your best bet. A Jose Canseco card from a major issue set or an update set is a lot more likely to gain in value than one of his cards from most regional or specialty sets. In case you don't know what an update set is, it's a 132 card special set that is an extension of a company's regular major set with exactly the same card design. Each year, the major sets are issued as early as January and February, months before the baseball season starts. Because they're printed so early, these sets show many players on teams they no longer play for. Also, each season sees many young stars establish themselves on major league teams when everyone expected them to spend another year in the minor leagues. To help make their major set become a more accurate record of the season's rosters, Topps issued a postseason update set in 1981 and have continued to make one every year since. Fleer began issuing one in 1984 and continues to issue theirs. Score issued an update set the very first year they produced cards and are also continuing to issue one. These sets of 132 cards include many players traded before or during the season. And the young players nobody had ever heard about before the season started. Topps even used its 1988 update set to include the cards of the U.S. Olympic team. The update sets are only distributed through dealers. You won't find them in any retail stores. Both collectors and price guides have come to accept them as an important extension of the regular season sets. Okay, sure, let me take it out for you. Yeah, sure. You guys come back to see it. The more involved you get with collecting baseball cards, the more questions you're going to have. To find answers, the best people to turn to are friends who have been collecting a long time or dealers at their card shops. Another way to find out all kinds of information about baseball cards is to go to a card show. Going to a card show is like going to dozens of dealer shops all at once. Dealers pay rent to the show organizer for the right to sit at a table and sell cards or any other sports memorabilia. With all these dealers under the same roof, a beginning collector can get answers to his questions and have a great opportunity to shop around for low prices on the cards he's looking for. There are dozens of shows held every year in every major city in our country and almost every region of every state has at least one card show each year. Monthly price guides carry information about upcoming shows. But another way to find out when card shows are coming to your area is to subscribe to a hobby newspaper. It will feature a calendar listing nearly every card show in the country and also include ads announcing the major ones. A complete hobby newspaper will also feature a question and answer column. Usually issued weekly, a hobby newspaper will also include articles on special areas of collecting. Previews and reviews of major card shows and new sets being released. 
and scores of ads listing nearly everything for your collection you can think of buying. Not only baseball cards, but items for storing your collection, like plastic pages, binders, and cardboard boxes. So now you know the difference between regional sets, specialty sets, major sets and update sets, and which price guides to find them in. You've also learned that the new sets collectors and investors are spending most of their money on are the major issued sets of Topps, Fleer, Donruss, Sports Flick, and Score, and those companies' update sets. The cards of your favorite players included in these sets are almost always worth more money than those same players' cards when found in regional and specialty sets. I've also said that dealers, experienced collector friends, or card shows are the best sources to get your hobby questions answered, but also recommended that a hobby newspaper can be a good source of information, with their question and answer columns, articles on special areas of collecting, ads for all kinds of baseball cards and collecting aids, a calendar of upcoming shows, reviews and previews of major card shows and newly released sets, and many other useful articles. After you've decided what cards you're going to collect and whether or not price guides and hobby newspapers are important to you, there are still many choices to be made of where to buy your cards and how to put your collection together. If you decide to collect a complete major set, you'll need to decide which company's set you want to buy. If you like the idea of supplementing your regular set with an update set, make sure you know which companies issue one. You may decide to collect major sets of several companies, or all the various sets, both major and specialty, of one particular company. Do you want to buy your sets already put together by a dealer? Either buying them at a card shop or through the mail? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, a few boxes or do you want to put your sets together yourself? You buying gum packs from candy counters or card shops until you have every card in the set. It's less expensive to buy a set already complete, but building your own set can be a lot more fun and is something families can enjoy doing together. If you're just interested in collecting cards of certain players or teams, rather than complete sets, then you'd be better off trading with other collectors or buying the cards you're looking for from dealers, rather than buying packs of cards when you're just looking for a few special players. Dealers can sell you almost any individual card of any major set, and also sell many of the regional and specialty sets that you might be interested in buying. Well, that's my introduction to collecting baseball cards. Right now it seems like the hobby is more concerned with how much cards are worth rather than how much fun collectors are having. But remember, cards can be bought and sold, but it's hard to put a price tag on the memories they represent. I hope watching this video makes card collecting easier and more enjoyable for every one of you. Before you buy your next baseball cards, ask yourself if your collection would still mean something to you if nobody wanted to buy it. If every baseball card was worth only a penny, which cards would you still collect? Have fun collecting, and see you at the ballpark.